Hi there, Maranatha. It's good to be with you again. Before I get into the Word, let me maybe just share with you just for a moment or two. You know, I've become aware of some people who are a little bit agitated because church is not open yet. And when are we going to open? And, you know, I've even heard of people who who are saying, you know, it's very difficult, you know, to be a Christian without coming to church. And, you know, and they don't know if they, you know, they're going to backslide if they can't come here. And, and I'm telling you, l- let me be honest, if there's one person who's battling with not having church, it's me. I'm telling you, this is what I do. And, and we can't get together. But then I'm reminded of so many Christians on this very continent in North Africa, let alone in other places, but just some of the Christians in North Africa who are persecuted for their faith, and many of them who cannot meet in big gatherings at all. And so they've got to meet secretly, and that's why we refer to them as the underground church, and they've got to, they've got to meet like that in little groups and get together, and, 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 and there they praise the Lord, not out loud, but quietly, it's almost like we would meet in, in, in cell groups, small groups. And they meet like that. And, and many of them can't even do that every week because then, then the authorities start picking up on a pattern. And, and so they can only meet from time to time because next week other people are going to meet there and, and so on. And, and then I, I look at them how they love God and they committed to the Lord, even though they don't have what we have, but they love God and they're following the Lord. And so I'm saying to us, hey, I know we're used to this and, and, and I know we spoiled and now we haven't been able to do it for quite a number of months, but we'll get through this. Don't allow the enemy to tell you that it's so bad and we'll never make it. You don't know if your faith is going to keep, man, keep going. Keep loving God and trusting God and and watching online. And I'm telling you, before we even know it, we're going to gather again in, in this place. All right. So let me share with you quickly today just a word that I have. Of course, we're still busy with James. Book of James is seen as one of the most practical books in the New Testament. One of the easiest to read and to understand, (laughs) but not always to apply. We know that sometimes we can know the right thing, but to do it, you know, we can know we need to love our enemy, but to do it, oh, that's that's maybe not that easy. Fortunately, what I want to share with you today is a lot easier to apply. And so we're going to talk about prayer. And so I'm, I want to start off this morning reading from James chapter 5. And listen to what he says here in verse 13. He says, are any of you suffering hardships? And immediately we want to go, that's me, James, that's me. As a matter of fact, that's most of us. That's most of the people, you know, in the world today. We, we're suffering hardship. <laughs> he gives us the answer. He says, okay. He says, you should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to come and pray. He uses that word again. And by the way, he's going to use that a number of times. Call the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick. and The Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, you will be forgiven. And then he says this in verse 16. Confess your sins each to the other and pray for each other that you may be healed. So when you're going through a difficult time, when you've backslidden and and, and you've gotten into some nonsense, he says it's good to go and share it with somebody. Go and share it with maybe with a pastor or one of your cell leaders and share it. Go and confess it and get them to pray with you. He says that you may be healed. And this healing here is referring to more than just physical healing, a bodily healing, but but there may be emotional healing or spiritual healing. And then he says this, the earnest prayer. Now it's not just the usual prayer that, that he's been referring to. Now he's referring to a different type of prayer. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power. And produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are. 
And yet when he prayed earnestly, here he says it again, when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. So six times he uses that word prayer or pray because prayer is the key. Prayer is powerful. And he's saying prayer is the thing that's going to get you out of where you are, be it sickness, be it hardships and difficulty. He says you need to pray. Now, let's see what Jesus said here in Luke chapter 11. He says, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? <laughs> or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So what He's saying is, if you don't ask, you're not going to receive. So the responsibility is on you and me to ask. Now, what's interesting here, He's referring to, to snakes and to scorpions. He says, if your children ask for fish, do you give them a snake? They ask for an egg? He says, do you give them a scorpion? Now, why does he talk about, about scorpions and, and snakes here? Well, let's go back here to the previous chapter, to chapter 10. Let me read to you. He says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Now, snakes and scorpions represent the power of the enemy. And what Jesus is saying, and this is what you and I need to get here, he says, man, I've given you authority. I've given you power over the enemy. And so prayer trumps the power of the enemy. Prayer is how you and I get out of the things that the enemy has initiated. He started in our lives. And prayer is the, the way to get out of that or to get, get through that. You see, so many times I've seen people look at things in their lives that go wrong and they think, oh, well, it's just God's will. <laughs> Have you considered that it may just be the devil's will? That Satan maybe has started that, that nonsense in your life, that he's initiated that very thing and that you need to take authority over that? Now, of course, the good news is that God can use that. Even though we're going through difficult times, man, God causes all things to work together for our good. And so God can use those things. God is strong enough, powerful enough. He's big enough to reverse the effects of the things that the enemy has started. He can replace uh, any of the, of the bad stuff the enemy has done. God can come in and God can replace those if we pray. The responsibility is on you and me to pray. Prayer is the key to God's power. You could say prayer is like the key to a, a sports car. You know, you look at a beautiful car and it's got a powerful engine in and, and, and you admire it and you can walk around it and, and it's just beautiful. It's just amazing. And, but unless you put the key in that car, it's going to do nothing. You know, it, then it's just, it's just nice to look at and to admire and you can, you can talk about it. <laughs> but you're never going to experience it. The moment you put the key in the car and you start it and that engine roars into life and you get in and you go for a drive, what happens? You experience that vehicle on a completely different level. And it's exactly the same when it comes to God's power. We can talk about God's power. We can read about God's power. And we can know everything about God's power. But unless you use prayer, activate God's power. You're not going to experience any of that in your own life. And so God is saying to you and me, He says, hey, you're going through hardships. Hey, you sick. He says, pray. Call the elders. Let them pray. Let them anoint you. He says, I've given you a key to my power, and it's up to you to use it or not to use it. I think the problem is so often prayer is our last resort instead of our first response. You know, when we go through a difficult time, you know, we try this and then we try that and we go to the doctor and we go and see an attorney maybe and, 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 and then maybe we'll come and see the pastor. <laughs> 
and then we'll turn to God. Once we've done all of that, then we'll turn to God. Now, let me say to you, God's not offended when he's your last resort. I mean, there are many examples in Scripture of people who turn to God as a last resort, and God was there. That, that, that's no skin off his back. It's skin off our back. You see, my point is, why turn to God as a last resort when you can turn to Him as your first response? And that's why, that's why James says to us, he says, any of you going through hardships, first response is you need to pray. First response is you need to turn to God. So let's go back to James chapter 5. He says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person. Notice it doesn't say you know, the casual prayer, the fleeting prayer, just shoot up a quick little prayer. No. He says the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And then he says this. He says Elijah was as human as we are. Now, there's a reason he's saying that. He says, remember Elijah? Remember how powerful he was and how he moved in God's power, how he called fire down from heaven? He says, remember that? He says, now, nah. he was as human as what you and I are. He says, and yet, when he prayed earnestly, here's that word again, earnest prayer, that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Now, let me give you another two references quickly to earnest prayer. In Colossians 4 verse 2, it says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And then 1 Peter chapter 4, therefore be earnest and disciplined in your prayer. Now, what is earnest prayer? The word used in the original language is sophronia. And it literally means to be in a sound mind. Another meaning for that is to be clear in your mind. So in other words, you're clear about what you're asking God for, but you're also clear about what Scripture says about that. So for instance, let's say you want to pray uh, for healing, and you're going through a difficult time uh, in your body and, and, and physically, and you've got to be clear about that. Be clear what you want to ask God for, but also be clear what Scripture says. So Scripture says there, He tells us to come and to ask God for healing in James chapter 5. And so you've got to be clear. The Bible also says, by His stripes we are healed. And Scripture tells us to come and to ask. And so be clear in your mind. Or maybe you've got a loved one, you know, who, who's not serving the Lord and they're getting their lives messed up. You've got to be clear what Scripture says. It's His will for all men to be saved. Or maybe you need direction and guidance. What does Scripture say? Commit your way into the Lord, and He'll make your path straight. So when I come to Him, when I'm clear about what I'm asking, and I'm clear about what Scripture says, guess what happens? My prayer is on a different level. My faith is on a different level. And that's when I come, and I pray earnest prayers, and I'm, I'm asking God on a completely different level. You see, friends, Satan knows how powerful our prayers are. Because Scripture says that the prayer of a righteous person has great power, produces wonderful results. And Satan knows that more than what you and I know that. And so he's going to do whatever he can to try and distract us, keep us from prayer, or try and discourage us. Because, you know, last time your prayer wasn't answered, whatever it is, he'll try and do that. And so we've got to realize how powerful prayer is and why God tells us to pray and to keep to keep coming back and to pray earnestly. Let me share with you quickly another story about earnest prayer. In Acts chapter 12, there's a story of King Herod Agrippa and how he put Peter into prison with the intention of killing him. You see, he'd already killed James, and he saw how it pleased the Jewish people. Now, by the way, it, it was politically motivated. That's the reason he, he did that. Now, it's interesting. The Bible says nothing about the church praying for James. And so what probably happened, it probably caught them by surprise. Before they knew it, James was executed, and it probably caught them completely by surprise. And like, what on earth happened here? And so now Peter is put into prison, and it's a very different story because the Bible specifically notes the earnest prayer for Peter. This is the night before his execution. So let me read it to you quickly from Acts chapter 12. 
But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. And suddenly there was a bright light in the cell. And an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. And the angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. And so Peter left the cell following the angel. It's kind of quite funny. The Bible says a bright light was on in, in, in the cell as, as the angel appeared. And he's still sleeping there. He's fast to sleep. It's like almost like putting stadium lights on when the Bible says it's bright. It must have been bright. And, and he sleeps. He doesn't even wake up so much so that the angel doesn't just tap him. But he has to strike him on the side and say, hey, man, get up. And, and he gets up. And the angel leads him right out of that prison. And so God did a miracle that day. Why? Because of the prayers of the church. They were busy praying. I think sometimes God allows difficulties and hardships to get our attention and, and to turn us back to Him. You see, God used Herod in that situation to get the church to, to, to bring them to their knees, to turn them back to God, to put their, their eyes back, back on Him again. And sometimes God does that in our own lives. Can I ask you, what is God busy using in your life at the moment? What hardship, what difficulty are you busy going through? God is busy using that to get you to turn back to him to put your attention back on him to come to him in earnest prayer you see we can have areas in our lives where everything is going well and and things are successful but there's one area that we're battling with now maybe your health everything else is going well but you're battling with your health or maybe it's your finances your health is good and your relationships are good and and all these other things spiritually you're doing well but financially you battling it may even be a relationship all your other relationships are doing well but there's one relationship man you're just battling that's the thing that you need to bring before god that's what james is saying he says you're going through hardships you battling and that's what you need to bring before him god wants to use that in in your life to put your attention back on him you see listening to sermons doesn't really produce praying people talking about prayer doesn't uh, produce praying people reading books about prayer doesn't really produce praying people but man when the enemy touches your health guess what happens that's when we start praying. When he touches your child, he touches your finances. When, when the doctor can't help you, when you've tried in your business, you've done this and you've done that and you've sold some stuff to put the money back in and to boost the cash flow and it's still not working. Guess what? It's time to pray. And so God wants us to pray. And James is saying, hey, turn to God, turn to God. Now, earnest prayer also has an element of being persistent think about the early church they were praying right through the night when peter was released he went back to the to the home where they were praying and he found them still busy praying this is what jesus taught remember the parable of the guy who had a friend come and visit and he didn't have food it was late at night and he goes and knocks on his neighbor's door and the neighbor sends him away go home and go home i'm in bed already i'm i'm almost asleep you know i can't help you now and he keeps on knocking on the door he keeps on like please man just give me some bread it's all i'm asking please man and he keeps on and he keeps on until eventually the neighbor gets up and helps him Jesus tells the parable of the unrighteous judge and the lady that comes to him and the judge sends her away. Same story. And she keeps on asking and keeps on bugging the judge until eventually the Bible says she wears him out. It's like a dripping tap. And eventually he gives in. And Jesus says, that's what you need to do. He says, keep on banging on heaven's door. There's an element of persistence. Remember when... Uh, Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments. Down on the bottom of the, of, the, of the mountain, the children of Israel were busy building a golden calf and busy worshiping this golden calf. 
And so you can imagine, you know, after everything God had done, leading them out of captivity, providing for them food and water and, and, and even heat at night with a, with a flame, the fire. I mean, and here they are, and suddenly they, they turn on God. And so God is just angry. He's just had enough. And so he says to Moses, he says, you know, I'm just, I'm going to wipe them out. And so Moses comes to God and he begs God and he pleads with God not to do that. And scripture says, so the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring upon his people. Isn't that amazing? Because of the persistent prayer of one man, an entire nation, millions of people were saved. And then God says to Moses, he says, you know what? I'm going to send my angel ahead of you to drive out your enemies, but, but I'm not going with you. He says, I'm just, I'm just sick and tired of these people. They're a stiff-necked, a, 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 a rebellious people, and, 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 and I, I've had enough. And again, Moses comes and he pleads with God. He says, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. And then God replies to Moses in verse 17, and he says, I will do the very thing you've asked. I can almost, I can almost sense God going, ah, okay, okay, I'll do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you. So notice his persistence. He comes and he asks and he, and he asks again and God changes things. The Bible actually says God changes his mind because of the persistent prayer of, of one person. Now, let me just say to you, that doesn't mean that God is going to change all your problems just because you're coming in earnest and because you're coming with persistent prayer. You may still have to battle with certain things. You may still have some unanswered prayer. But Scripture doesn't tell us to focus on the unanswered prayer. Scripture tells us to focus on the one who answers prayer. So in other words, he says, come and pray and keep praying. Whether God answers it now or later or down the line, that's up to him. That's his prerogative. But let us do what God's called us to do. And that's to pray and to keep on praying. There's got to be earnest prayer and there's got to be persistent prayer. And so can I ask you, when last did you put time aside to pray about that issue that you're battling with? Be it health, be it finances, be it relationship, whatever it is. When last did you fast about that situation? Remember I shared the illustration with you before about the scale. Remember the, those old-fashioned scales where you, you, you put so, uh, an, an, an item, an article on it, and it, and it just it tips to that side? And so you've got to put weights on the other side to try and balance it. And I think sometimes our prayer life is like that, where there's a problem on the one side. <laughs> and so we've got to come and we've got to put prayer, we've got to weigh this side with prayer the problem is so often we come with our prayers and we drop a little prayer little fleeting prayer in this side and it's almost like it goes cling <laughs> and it makes no difference at all it's weighted down on that side by the problem and so what we need to do is to come be clear in our mind come with earnest prayer but also come with persistent prayer and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray, and keep on praying, and keep on praying, until eventually we tip those scales. And that's just a picture that I have in my mind that helps me. And we never know when it's going to tip the scales, but we've got to keep on going until we do that. You see, talking about prayer is not going to tip the scale. Complaining about the situation is not going to tip the scale. But praying about that situation, praying about the problem, as, as James tells us to do, oh, that's a different story. That starts tipping the scales in our favor. You know, Peter was set free from that prison simply because of the prayers of, that, of the early church. 
And so I don't know what your prison is. I don't know what's holding you back. But what I do know is that God still sets people free today. Jesus said this. He says, He has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. I want to say to you today, Jesus is still in the business of setting people free. Our responsibility is to pray. It's that key. It's the key to God's power. We've got to pray that into being. Too many people today, you know, when they pray, they just complain. Oh, God, this thing is so terrible. God, you know, they've treated me so badly. God, I'm suffering so much. And what are they doing? They're just complaining, complaining, complaining. Listen, prayer is not about complaining. It's about exchanging. You see, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know what he's saying? He he says, come, give me your burden. Give me the hardships. Give me the fear and and, and the anger and the frustration and the worry. Give it to me, (laughs) And, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace. I'll give you calm. You know, it's interesting. They say many intercessors battle with depression. Why is that? Because they haven't clicked this thing. The complaining and and the exchanging. And so what they do is they come and they they complain and they, they bring the problems and they lay it at the Lord's feet. But they never get to the place where they allow Him to exchange it for rest, for peace. And for calm. And so God makes that invitation to you and me. He says, come on, man. (laughs) Bring that stuff. You see, friends, God is not only there in our times of comfort. But he's also there in our times of crisis. He's especially there in our times of crisis. And it's in those times that God says to you and me, he says, come, bring that stuff. Let me exchange it. Let let me give you a rest. Listen to what Isaiah says. He says, He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired. And young men will fall in exhaustion. You know what he's saying? (laughs) Everybody goes through some difficulty at some stage. Even youths, even young men. He says, man, everybody goes through that. He says, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. Those who trust in the Lord. And I believe this is what happened to Peter. Remember scripture says he was sleeping. Listen to this. He says, the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. And so the text says he was asleep. This is the night before his execution. I mean, this is crazy. And Peter is sleeping. You want to say, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) Is this the same Peter who just chopped off the guy's ear just before Jesus was arrested? The same Peter who jumped out of the boat and started walking on water? The same Peter that said to Jesus, Lord, Lord, you know, Even if they all deny you, I I won't. You know, like fiery Peter, feisty Peter. And yeah, he's fast asleep. (laughs) That's exactly what happens when we come to God in earnest prayer, in just persistent prayer. We get to the place where he takes that fear, that worry, that concern, Whatever it is, he takes that from us and he he replaces it with rest, with peace and calm. And Peter is able to sleep there, no problem because of that. All right, now, I've shared with you about earnest prayer. I've shared about persistent prayer. Let me share quickly one last thought, and it's about united prayer. So you have earnest prayer, persistent prayer, and united prayer. Listen, 
I want to encourage you when you pray, especially when it's around a, a serious problem or something, pray with somebody. Get somebody else to pray with you. This is what the early church were doing. They weren't praying alone. They weren't each praying at home, but they gathered together. They united their faith and they prayed together. Remember the story of the Tower of Babel? Remember what God said? <laughs> Listen to this. He says, the people are united. Nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Nothing they set out to do. God says there, there is an incredible power when you unite and you start working together. You start praying together. Something happens. And that's what we do when we get together in, in let's say, in a, in a prayer meeting. You'll always have somebody leading that meeting. And the leader will say, well, let's pray about this today. And so we're not going to pray about a whole lot of things. We're going to pray about one or two things, but first we pray around this. And it doesn't mean we all pray the same thing over and over. No, we all pray around the same thing. We, we hit it from, from different angles. And so that's what we're doing. But we're united in prayer. And then when we've exhausted that, then we move on and we say, all right, now let's pray about the next thing. Isn't it funny? I, I just find it so funny. When we're in a prayer meeting, we're praying about this specific thing. And then the next moment, somebody starts praying about their neighbor's cat and the kittens and stuff. And it's like, and you, you see what's happening? It just distracts everybody. And, and everybody is thinking, now what? Where did that come from? <laughs> that's why we need to be focused. And that's why we united around one specific thing. And so that's what I want to do this morning. Just in closing, I want to unite my faith and your faith right there where you are. And unfortunately, we can't gather together at the moment. We will pretty soon. I, you know, we trust God for that. But I want to unite my faith with yours and pray about that situation that's heavy on your heart. And so won't you mention it to the Lord? Just, just bring it to Him again, and let's pray around that. Father, we mention this situation to you. And whether we've brought it on ourselves or whether it's the economy or this pandemic or whether it's the enemy, that doesn't matter really what the source is or who the source is. What matters is who can reverse this and who can change this situation, Lord. And so we're bringing it before you. And, and, and I'm uniting my faith now with them, Father. And I'm saying, Lord, we trusting you for a breakthrough. You've told us in the Word that we need to come and we need to pray. And so we're doing that. And I pray right now that you're just going to bring them peace and calm and rest even before the breakthrough we think of peter lord there he is sleeping before he was set free he had peace and calm and so i pray for every single person going through difficulty and hardship that you will just put your peace your rest upon them even before the breakthrough and god we're going to trust you for that breakthrough and we're going to come before you again and again and again until we tip the scales. Amen. Bless you.